All right, so welcome to our February Extension Master Gardener Coordinator discussion. Some upcoming announcements and save the dates. Our National Extension Conference on Volunteerism this year will be virtual. That's in April, so if you'd like to learn more about it, we have the link there. And we also have the International Master Gardener Conference in September. So we have the link there as well if you want to read more and um, just kind of get an idea of what the presentations might be and see if you're interested. Both of those are gonna be excellent conferences uh, for Master Gardener coordinators. Okay. So our next discussion, we do have the schedule completed for 2021. We have a few speakers that we're just putting them in a few months. Um, so before we get to Christy, I just wanted to let you all know that you'll get some announcements for our March discussion. And in March, we have Marissa Ann Coyne. Marissa is in California, and she has done a lot of work with volunteering in COVID-19. And this is something that you all, uh, when I have been asking on behalf of the Professional Development Committee for the National uh, Committee, uh, I've been asking for your feedback on what uh, webinars would be helpful to you and which areas you'd like to learn more about. And so a lot of people said, we wanna learn more about online learning. We wanna learn about how to engage volunteers during COVID-19. We wanna learn best practices for online training. So you'll notice that the next three webinars really focus on those topics. And we also plan after a few of these webinars, when I send out the schedule, you'll see where we have regional discussions planned. And so I'll list the states that are in those region and we have a member of our national committee that will stay on after the webinar topic that month. And then that way, if you wanna talk among your colleagues and your peers and have some time for some regional discussions, uh, we'll provide that this year. That was a uh, bit of feedback that came from a few folks where they had asked for some more engagement among each other and the opportunity to brainstorm and talk to people uh, from your region. So we'll integrate that at the end of a few different uh, webinars this year. All right, so if you could, please take a moment to let us know what state you're joining us from. All right, so we have a good group on today. We've got 47 of us, and we're from all over the country, from sunny Florida to Ohio to Georgia, Oregon, Kentucky. Uh, I see someone is from the Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, Elizabeth, actually, my husband is taking a job there, so that's pretty exciting. Um, we also have Wyoming. Uh, Illinois, North Carolina, Maryland, and North Carolina, North Carolina, again, Kansas, lots of other states. So thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today from all over the country as Extension Master Gardener Coordinators. Uh, my name is Nicole Pinson. I am here uh, serving on behalf of the Extension Master Gardener National Committee. I'm an at-large member with professional development and I help to plan and coordinate our monthly webinar discussions. And today we have Christy Marsden, Christy is joining us from Minnesota. And uh, Christy, I bet it's cold there, right? <laughs> yeah. <Yep. laughs> I have a friend who just moved from St. Petersburg, Florida to uh, Minneapolis. And she's posting on Facebook just how much of a change it's been uh, adjusting from Florida to Minnesota. So yeah. Christy works with the Minnesota Master Gardener Volunteer Program. And she is a horticulture educator and education manager. In this position, Christy creates horticulture and volunteer community engagement learning experiences for volunteers, and she does this both online and in-person environments. And so I know during COVID-19, uh, Christy and many of our programs have pivoted quite a bit uh, to offer some different trainings and perspectives to our volunteers to keep them engaged. So this is gonna be an informal discussion. Uh, Christy actually doesn't have slides. She's going to share her screen and just kind of talk about next and best practices for training for Extension Master Gardener volunteers. And Christy, do you want people to save their questions for the end of the presentation or just kind of unmute and ask you as you go? Um, I think unmuting and asking as you go or putting it in the chat box would be fantastic. Um, my Goal, my goal with this presentation is to really treat it like a discussion so that as we have questions or if people are curious, um, I'd love to talk about what we do, 
and I can definitely start off with that, but if people had their own experiences or own um, recommendations or questions as to what we're doing as you start to think about these things. And I'd love to hear them as we go um, and do that. So that'll be exciting. Um, so I guess what I'll do just so that we know there's a different, there's a change is I'm gonna share my screen just with my course so that you know it is me talking. I'm gonna move it over here so I'm still looking at my camera. Uh, so my name is Christy Marsden. Um, as Nicole said, I am the education manager for the Master Gardener Volunteer Program in Minnesota. I have been working in this position since about 2017. Um, and my goal when I started was to redevelop and kind of revamp our online education. In the state of Minnesota, to become a Master Gardener volunteer, you have to take our training, which we call the core course, and it's offered once a year and it's only offered by the state. So in Minnesota, we have a pretty, we have a pretty solid state leadership team that kind of helps support a lot of the local programs and does this education. So this means if we're supposed to meet the needs of the entire of state of Minnesota, uh, we have to make sure that we're accessible in a lot of different formats. So we've had online education. Um, I don't actually know how long the course has been online, but um, when I started in 2017, it was my job to redo it and kind of develop it and give it a, a better overall structure. Um, so we've had an online curriculum for a while, um, which worked out really well because when the pandemic hit, now we could just move everything online and we already had a pretty strong foundation for what we have been doing. Um, what we used to do prior is we would offer in-person sessions as well. This is more of that traditional training where you could come. Um, each topic area that we provided a lecture on was about three hours long. And we would do those on Fridays and Saturdays for about six hour stretches um, on, uh, in January and then the first weekend in February. Um, so obviously this year we moved everything online and really use this as an opportunity, or I used it as an opportunity to really try different things and really dig in more towards online learning and what we can do with it and how to really enhance that as much as possible. Um, and so part of that included is one of the things that I've learned as a best practice is that, you know, uh, it is a lot for people to learn all of this content all at once. For seasoned gardeners, it might not be as much, but we have a lot of new gardeners joining the program as well. And it can be really, like, I remember people would walk away from the course being like, oh my gosh, there's just too much to remember. It's like a fire hose of information. And for me, that's, I don't want anybody to feel overwhelmed and like they can't volunteer or they can't kind of grasp what they're supposed to be doing because it's just too much. Um, and from what we, what the adult pedagogy has taught me and what I have learned is that when we learn as adults, sitting through a three hour lecture is actually not a great way to learn. But for some reason, we love it and we think that that's a great way to learn. But actual comprehension stops at about 40 to 50 minutes. And so the idea of providing all of this information in huge, massive chunks all at once not only can be really overwhelming for students, um, but it doesn't actually enhance learning. So one of my, the thing that I was most excited about in switching to be entirely online this year and being able to play around with the course a little bit more is expanding out how long we asked volunteers to complete this course. So we started the second week in January and we will be finished with it in uh, middle of April. So we're giving people about 14, 15 weeks to go through all the material, encouraging folks to spend about one week in each particular content area that lines up with some um, online work that we're doing as well. And I'm really excited in the evaluations to see how this kind of translates, if people find that that's a better pace for them um, and that they enjoy that learning more. I haven't gotten to that evaluation part yet because we're still only like a month into it at this point. Um, but from what I've been able to tell by interacting with people online in the discussion forums and just hearing back, I think it's a lot less stressful so far. Um, okay, um, so that was one of the big things that we did when we switched over. Um, another thing that we did is we tried to encapsulate a little bit of that in person. I did a handful of surveys to um, people who had taken the course in the last couple of years asking about what did they value from that in-person experience um, and what were 
what do you think that they were most going to miss if they weren't able to meet in person? Um, and one of the biggest things that we found and what we heard from people um, was that it's that social element and being able to talk to each other. Um, that is something that a lot of people really enjoyed about having the in-person sessions. Um, and then from my own experience, and nobody really highlighted this as much, but based on what I see volunteers doing at these sessions, it's also being able to connect with our experts and ask them questions. Uh, every year, and I'm sure you find it the same with your training, is that volunteers have such good questions and they want to spend their time asking and really digging into topics and really like getting the satisfaction of meeting these experts and asking their questions and kind of like learning on this deeper level. So the question posed to me then is, is how can we provide that experience with this online course, which itself is pretty asynchronous. So how do we do this where people can meet with experts, they can ask their questions, they can feel satisfied because they're getting a little bit of feedback, uh, but it's not something that um, we have to do in person. So what we decided to do is we did Zoom Q&As um, every Thursday evening from 6.30 to 8.30. Um, and this is an opportunity for interns to come and ask their questions of the various experts on each of the topic area. The additional feature of this is it also kind of gives a point to encourage people to move through the course. So if you know that by this Thursday, we're going to be talking about entomology, then you know, okay, well, I'll work on entomology this week. And it kind of helps push people along because I'm sure as you're uh, aware and as people know is sometimes with adult learners, you have to kind of encourage them to continue moving through the course. Um, all right, somebody said, did we freeze up? And it says my screen sharing is paused, so I don't know what's going on, but if it happens again, let me know. Uh, so anyway, uh, this kind of helps push people through and kind of helps encourage them to learn because we know that like with asynchronous learning, it can be pretty easy to just say, yeah, I'm gonna do that. And then like never get back into the course. Um, so we, um, we started doing these Zoom Q and A's um, and how these work is they are 6.30 to 8.30 in the evening and people can come in. Um, it's a webinar. And the idea behind a webinar is because we weren't sure how many people we would have. We had over 400 people as a part of our core course this year. And then we also do this at the same time um, with uh, a version of the course that is for not for volunteers um, called ProCourt. And we had about 200. So 600 people total could attend and we have a limit for meetings at 300. So it's like, okay. Make it a little bit easier, we'll do it as webinars. Um, and it's actually worked really well so far. So our best practices with these webinars is having um, at least two to three people to help manage it. So my colleague, Laura Vogel and I, we take turns asking questions of the experts um, and then um, helping manage the chat and the Q&A at the same time. It really helps to have at least one or two other people to help manage that. Because as I'm sure you're all aware, it's really hard to manage a Zoom and keep on top of like coordinating everything, but then also doing the work of asking questions and, and doing that. So we found um, that super helpful. And one of the things that we did to try to help us get beyond that is as we posted these, um, people can submit their questions prior as well. And we do have a fair amount of people who do that. We let the experts coming in know that this, the questions are there. So then that they can kind of get a preview of what's going to be asked and then research anything that maybe they're not sure about. Um, and so I think we've, we've had a handful now and they've gone really well. Uh, and what we'll do is we post a recording with any of the links that came up in the discussion after the fact so that people can come watch the recording, read the transcript if possible, um, and then some of the links that we provided. Now, one of the things that my team does um, in Minnesota and that I think is always a good practice is we try to take as much feedback as possible from the master gardeners and from our learnings to really kind of make whatever we're providing better. So the transcripts are one of those things where in the beginning I didn't post the transcripts and then a few people asked, can we have these because this would really help my learning. And that's something that definitely we can do and it makes it easier. So that's something that we tried to provide. But this is one of the big things that we did differently this year with our course to try to enhance that online learning. And I think that that has worked in terms of helping people 
um, engage with the course and kind of keep excited and being interested with online learning. Um, taking a step back with this course, one of the things that we do, and this is similar to what Colorado does as well, is we, re, we take this course and this is for volunteers. And then we're also able to repackage it for non-volunteer audiences. So we take out some of the things that are specific just towards volunteers. Um, and we call it ProCourt. And what uh, ProCourt is, is it's for green industry people or folks who are not interested in volunteering, but kind of want to learn more. Um, and then we sell that at a different price point. And that has enabled us to be able to bring funds into the program in ways that we weren't able to before. Um, and uh, I work closely with Katie. We've been sharing ideas for the past couple of years as she's built her online learning program. And she and I both, um, were, would have told you all about the fact that like we have record amounts of interest in both the core course or like main volunteer courses and that pro court course in ways that it's brought in money that we just didn't expect. And so this is a great kind of way to think about maybe bringing in additional fundings and different ways to package this online learning. For me and the way that I approach it is trying to think about how we can use this in multiple formats. So the content that I put in here is very much just for volunteers, but the cohort, which is that um, the professional audience, um, we can take out components from that. And then I have colleagues across the university extension who also use some of the components I built for this course um, in their own work as well. So it, it works really well. Um, Julie asked, how much do we charge for each? So for the core course, with the other fees, it's $295. And then the pro court um, is $595. So it's about 600. Um, so if you wanna do the math, if we had 200 people sign up for the pro court and about 400 sign up for the core course, that brought in a lot more than any of us were expecting. Um, the online education and the interest in this online education was more than our team even fathomed to expect. Um, so that's been kind of a huge, um, huge surprise. And it's been really uh, kind of fun to dive in and kind of see what it is and, and how we can continue moving this forward. So, uh, and as you have questions, if you want, keep asking them in um, the chat. I'm just gonna kind of explain what I do and what it is this is. So if you have questions that are more particular or any other aspect, feel free to interrupt because um, I'm just gonna keep talking. I love talking about what I do and it's so much fun talking about it with other people who enjoy it. So, um, and can anybody take pro war? Yes, it, you don't have to be limited to the state of Minnesota. Um, so it is very Minnesota specific content though. So we, you know, don't talk about plants that you can't grow here. Uh, so it might not be as useful if you're not in a place that it gets really, really cold. Um, but we found that this works pretty well. So the way that I built this course, um, this course for, I guess, best practices, and I will caveat here and say that, you know, I came into this position. Um, I um, have a degree in horticulture and um, human development, and I worked as a county-based horticulture educator with Master Gardeners in Wisconsin before I came into this position. I worked with Mike um, and as he was developing his, um, Mike Maddox in Wisconsin, as he was developing his flipped classroom approach. And that really kind of inspired my thought process on how we can do online education differently. Um, and I've learned a lot as we go. So I don't have a formal background in academic technology or instructional design, but I have taken coursework to get a certificate. And I do dive in as much as I can with my professional development on how do adults learn? How do we do this online? And I do a lot of trial and error with my online course. Every year I try things differently to try to hit on what's working, what's not. So what I'm gonna show you is really just what works for us in Minnesota, what the best practices that I have found are. You might find that this doesn't work for you based on what is um, what constraints or what you have to work with in the university or your system um, or your capacity. Because the other part of this is, is this is the entirety of my job. I'm um, working with Katie Dunker in Colorado. You know, she's doing that, but she's also the director of the Colorado Master Gardener program. So there's a lot that she has to do and education is just one small part of it. Whereas for me, education of master gardeners and the audiences they serve is the entirety of my job. So I have a lot of capacity to do this work and a lot of um, capability to dive in and really try different things and really grow within it. So 
what I'm able to do and, and kind of this works well for us. Um, and if you have questions about it, either now you can put them in the chat or reach out later. And I'd love to kind of explain more of my process um, and what it looks like. But for us, um, and what works for us is we, um, as most things, split each of the content into um, different uh, modules or chapters. And what we did this year, which I am super glad we did, and I do think that this is a best practice, so I'm going to take some time to go over it, is we put in a bunch of introduction material. So something that I didn't really grasp before I had done the survey earlier this year is that there's a bit of a learning curve with doing online education. And of course there is, right? But I think that just the fact that I'm on my computer every day, it kind of makes you forget that not everybody is. And some of these systems that we're working with can be really unfamiliar and really um, daunting. So what I did is I built in some introduction materials to introduce people to how to just navigate an online course, because this could be the first time that they're doing something like this um, and jumping into this technology. There's a lot going on when you become a master gardener, because not only are you learning new material, but you're learning new technology to learn that new material, and you're learning how to be a volunteer with all of the constraints for that. So we, my effort was to try to, as much as possible, to make an introduction that um, helped walk people through just some of the basics of how to, to handle online learning, and then also give it a personal touch. So I put a picture of me here, and I try to use I statements because I want people to know that there's a human on the other side. This isn't just a computer screen where you're just going to pick up your information and go, but there are people here, and we care about you, and we want you to learn. So I was very specific in the way that I approached the language um, and how I kind of wrote this material. One of the things that we also added um, is a way to track your progress through the course. This was something that um, somebody asked after the course already started, and I try to be really, really responsive um, to people as they're giving me feedback through the course. So I was able to put this in once the course already started to help kind of answer those. Um, okay, let's see, I see a question. Um, okay. So for the, um, and I'm going to walk a little bit through what that, um, what the online learning kind of looks like. So you'll see here, I kind of talk about what the progress bar is, and then I kind of just start to introduce elements as you go through this welcome. So it's like, oh, hey, this is who I am. This is the progress. You can click next to get to the next page. And so I slowly just start to introduce things. So you'll see this is an introduction to our page. And then now I introduce drawers. So what are drawers where you click on it and then you can learn more about the particular people in the course. I asked each of my colleagues to write pretty in person, like very like less bio on the back of a book you wrote and more like, hey, you're just getting to know me type of bios here because I know that that's one thing that I was going to miss from meeting the interns is them getting to know me in a different type of way. So I really wanted to be able to provide that here. Um, what I also tried to do is integrate, um, all right, so we integrated a welcome video and this was just a way for us to say, hey, here we are, we're so glad you're here because one of the things that's missing is that excitement and like, you're here and we're so excited and it's really hard to put that into words, right? So what we did is we created a short video um, to kind of help welcome people in, to give some of that information. And then what we usually do is do a pretty good orientation um, including videos of how, what people are doing here relates to our program priorities. And we talk about some of our projects. So for example, like nearby nature, there's a video on a project that we did that really highlights the healing power of nature. And so volunteers can go through and do that um, as well. And so you're introduced to the, uh, you're also introduced to that. So here's where I introduce people to discussion forms. Um, and discussion forms are really one of the most, um, uh, one of my favorite parts of the course. Um, let's see, how do, um, the orientation, by the way, this is the orientation. So this, what you're reading, what you're seeing, what you're doing is the whole orientation. That video is about 10 minutes. One of the best practices that I do is my videos are no longer than 10 to 15 minutes. And 15 minutes is still too long. I really try to keep it at 10 minutes or below. And I'll show you that when I get into more of the content. This is just like that introduction. Um, what I also do as a best practice is I make sure to respond to each and every person who 
po like post anything on the discussion forums. For me, that's really important for them to know that somebody is reading these and somebody is responding. We've all been in those courses where, oh, we kind of think we have to like do it and nobody responds and we realize it doesn't matter. I'm one of those people. I definitely would not be the type of person who would use discussion forums in an online course, but some people really enjoy it. And to know that somebody else is on the back end kind of reading and paying attention to um, is something that I feel really strongly about. And the additional bonus from this actually this year has been that there's been a great amount of joy in these discussion forums. I didn't realize how much people were excited to learn about this, pro like to be in this program and learn from each other. And it's just, it's actually really fun to read. So I'm just gonna real quick, there is over 800 posts. So we're not gonna go through any of them really. Um, part of this, yeah. This is Nicole. If you're um, showing different components of the Canvas course, we're just seeing the home screen. So I just wanted to double check if we're supposed to be going through modules or any other you, screens. Yeah, you are supposed to. Did the screen share okay. stop? Let me see. It may have, yeah. All right, let me see. Now are you seeing a page? Yes. Okay, um, is it gone program now? Program details. Mm -hmm. I know what happened. Okay, sorry about that. So what I had shown, uh, I need to, all right, I'm gonna try one more time. So what I had shown was just, um, um, you can see here's the discussion forum. I'm gonna go. You're just gonna have to see the side of my face. Sorry, guys. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I'll just keep moving through. And then, all right, yeah. So then this is more of that orientation. So here's like an orientation page with a lot more of what you would expect out of an orientation of the details. The reason why I didn't put this into a video is because. Um, my personal feeling is it's really hard to kind of, um, it's really hard to like, like document all the details and the nitpicky stuff that are really important. So I wanted something that people could read so then that they can come back to it as well. So if they had any questions, they can go back to this page and they can know what to expect as an intern and then also what to expect as a, um, a certified Master Gardener volunteer. This page doesn't exactly follow all of the best practices for online learning because it is a lot of content. Um, but you'll notice there's a heavy use of bullet points because that's best for online learning um, and then bold to try to draw people into particular areas. Um, and then anyway, more details on particulars. So if people had questions and then lastly, this was the last thing I wanted to get to the orientation um, is I learned this in one of my instructional design learnings is the idea of course expectations. So when we take a course in lot, like in person, um, we have the syllabus, right? Where we know what to expect from the instructor and they know what to expect from us. So this was kind of my intention of trying to say, hey, I have expectations from you and I will meet these expectations you have of me. And it's really just like participate, engage, seek help if you need it. And this was my hope with this was to try to help prime people to understanding that we're going to be learning here and learning's a journey and it might be uncomfortable and it might not be something that you're used to, um, but we're here and we're going to try it. And so with this, and this is specific towards Canvas, which is this online platform that we use for this class, it's just a quick saying, I agree to this. I have no idea if this has had an impact or not, but I felt pretty excited about it. Anyway, okay. So that was one of the best practices that I tried this year. Um, and based on some of the questions and feedback that I haven't gotten, I think it really has made a difference to help people get comfortable with the new technology and kind of walk them through the whole of it. So anyway, um, let me get into a little bit of the content because I think that's one of also the more curious parts of this. So we base the content out of what kind of it always has been like, but just kind of also what makes sense and what matches, matches our modules um, from our chip. Matches our manual. So botany, general horticultural soils, composting, IPM. This year, I was really excited to change up the order. So throughout the core course, I have built in this idea that we work with IPM, we use IPM as master gardeners, and we apply IPM. So each of the various content and um, content areas, like entomology, vegetables, fruits, has IPM practical practice. And the idea behind this is, hey, you're a master gardener, you're likely going to be asked questions about this, so let's practice IPM in each of these content areas. So what I did this year is I put IPM as the third place that people, the third learning module to really introduce it because we'd be using it throughout. The 
the idea here is saying, hey, we use IPM. This is what it is. Get familiar with it because we're going to keep coming back to it over and over as we go through the content to see how it applies. Um, and we'll see how that works out. Um, I told you that I experiment every year. So this was one of those experimentations with that. I'm going to dive into um, lawns because I really like the way I did lawns. Um, so if we get into what some of the content looks like, this is an example of what some of those videos are. This video itself is four minutes and 71 sec or 17 seconds. Um, I created all of the videos um, and I have a very specific way that I approach the videos and how I do the videos. Um, I don't really wanna play them because you can't really hear it right now, but if I kind of click through that you can see, it's not a PowerPoint presentation. In fact, this is entirely just voiced over pictures and videos um, to illustrate some of the topics that I'm telling people. The reason why I do this is because this also follows the best practices that I've learned for how adults learn. We don't learn by reading and hearing at the same time. There's just too much cognitive stuff going on. The best way to learn is to hear and see, but not have to read at the same time. So for a PowerPoint presentation, it doesn't really work for this capacity. So what I've done is created these videos. Uh, the way that I do the videos is I work with a team of content experts uh, that I pull together both from like uh, extension educators. So in this case, a lawn person um, and I'll also bring in master gardeners who are really experienced in that particular area. Um, and then I'm on that team as well. And the idea is, is are we covering? I always ask, are we covering everything we should be covering? Is it understandable? Um, and, you know, does it make sense and it's not too deep? Uh, I start out by creating a content outline. Here's everything we're going to cover. I run it past my advisory team. Uh, and then based on that, I write scripts. I do scripts and storyboards because I don't want people to come back after the video is made and being like, oh, you know what? That wasn't right. So the idea is that script is the place where somebody can come in and say, you know, this needs to be worked out or this should be done differently. I have those content experts look at the script, give feedback. Um, and then at the end, I have an editor look, look through it and kind of help clean up the language and make it work for being written out loud. Those scripts are exactly what I say in these videos. So I record my voice and then I spend some time in video editing software, kind of putting it together with the different imagery that will help illustrate those topics that I'm um, explaining. And so this is kind of the core of what that content is. A lot of it is stock photos um, or photos that I've taken or that my colleagues have, um, but I think that it works pretty well. Some of the feedback that I've heard that people like this um, is that they are a little bit more engaging. And I chunk out, you'll notice if I go back to this page, uh, I chunk out the topic areas into something that's a little bit, all right, let me get, let me get where I was going, there we go, to make it a little bit more digestible. So the idea is, um, you know, we have one on the science of grass, which is different than grass selection and lawn establishment, which is different than maintenance. And what I've heard from people that they like this is because if they struggled with a particular area or they wanted to go back and kind of high, like, you know, revisit something, they can get to that particular topic area and not have to watch the entire thing over again. Um, one of the other things that I do in these videos is you'll notice link check. So as you're watching a video, it might, um, you'll see in the video, a pop-up will happen. Um, and the idea with the pop-up is it just, it's not showing really well, but you'll have to trust me it's there. Uh, the idea with the pop-up is it encourages a little bit of deeper learning. What I try to do with the core course is the videos are really, if you just watch the videos, you're gonna be great. If you do the links, that's a way to dive in deeper. So if you think learning about the science of grass is actually really exciting and you want to learn more about fine fescues, then you can click on this link and get to a page and dive in deeper. It's not required, but it's there for that additional learning. And then the activity is a way that we can apply that type of learning. So I try to scaffold it so that you can dive in as deep or not as deep as you want to. And this is embedded throughout the course. Um, Activities are a way to apply what we've learned. Um, and these I provide either entirely online through Qualtrics, and then I embed them in 
or they're being, you can print them and do them in person um, by yourself or online. And this is, so this, for example, is an ID or grasses, and it kind of walks you through um, how to identify based on some of the terms that we've learned uh, and some of the handouts that we've provided. So that's just a way to kind of apply some of that solid, some of that science. Um, and so this is kind of how I break down the content and how our course looks. Um, what are the activity examples of both online and the Google Doc? Um, this activity, this is a sustainable lawn management activity. The way that the Minnesota program approaches lawn management is we want to do it from the, from the place of um, sustainability. So my approach was to say, hey, look, you can have whatever kind of lawn you want. That's totally fine. But the way you can have the most sustainable lawn is to make sure that your expectations of what you want it to look like match the amount of time and effort you're willing to put in. And when those don't match is usually when we have problems. So I built a expect, uh, management guide, which kind of walks through what those expectations are and kind of what it looks like for management. So in Minnesota, you know, like it's the different height, how time you fertilize, such as that goes. Um, and it kind of walks people through asking these questions. It's like, okay, if I want this type of situation, what kind of grass, so on and so forth. Um, I feel like I'm getting too much into the details, but this stuff excites me. So please forgive me. Um, anyway, an activity to apply. So that's kind of how all of our courses are built out. I also try to have at least one discussion within each module to apply or to have people communicate with each other about particular ideas. So for this one on the next page, once you've completed that activity, you can dive into that discussion form where you can talk about if you're gonna change your habits or what you've learned or what's gonna make you do things differently um, within that course. So that's kind of how our modules are built out. When uh, I take a step back and we look like, or when we look at all of this, it's my job to kind of make it have a cohesive, cohesive curriculum. So when I look at the entirety of this course, I want them, I want it to feel the same. I want to have the same message throughout and as we're going through. So it really helps to be able to do this because now I can talk about IPM in each module um, and have the same approach to IPM. We can have the same approach to pesticides and how we talk about pesticides throughout the entirety of the course. And by the time you're at this point in the course, you know what to expect from me and what this learning looks like. Um, so some of the questions that had come up with the video production and editing, that is all done by me. And those are skills I learned by myself um, through a bit of trial and error and just curiosity. Um, at the University of Minnesota, we use the We Video software. It's an online video editing software. Um, I think of it kind of like video software for dummies where like there's enough for you to be able to do what you want, but not too much that it's overwhelming. So like, for example, I can't do much with sound. It's just as I recorded it, I can't change levels and stuff. And that's fine because I feel like that'd be a little too much um, for me. But this is something that I've done. Um, I had a little bit of help jumping in when I first started by some of our academic technologists at the U, but everything you see here, I've just kind of taught myself. Um, with Canvas, this is the Canvas platform. And this is kind of the same story. I just sort of taught myself. Um, Last year, the year before last, we, we used to use Moodle, so everything had to be converted over to Canvas. Um, and so it was just learning how Canvas works. I prefer Canvas over Moodle because I think it's a better experience for the user. And I try to make sure as much as possible that I make it as user friendly and easy to use um, and, and make as much sense as possible. And Canvas, I feel, does a really, really good job with that. Um, there's a lot of ways in which you can change some of this content. So like the templates here and just have that cohesive look that I've been able to play with over time to really kind of develop um, a look that I like. I know that some universities might not allow as much freedom. And I know even the University of Minnesota is starting to talk about having more of a standardized across the board approach. Um, but I really hope that they don't because I really like what I have going on here. Um, and Elizabeth, you asked what authoring tools. I don't know what you mean by that question. So if you want to explain authoring tools, I would love to be able to better answer that question. Sure. My question was about um, tools such as Rise 360 or Storyline, if you used any um, 
tools that are specifically meant for instructional design in the creation of the content that we see here? Yeah, we don't, we didn't use any of those. So the University of Minnesota, we don't have the capacity to embed any of those within Canvas. So this is just Canvas and what I've made and what I have put there. Um, I know the Colorado, she uses one of them. I forget the name of it, um, but it's super slick. It looks really nice. And, um, but, and they embed those within Canvas, but the University of Minnesota doesn't do any of that. So this is all, um, I just made all of this and put it there. Um, yeah, some universities do have Canvas templates available for instructors to use. Um, I just didn't like the templates our university had, so I just did my own thing. Um, I think it worked out. Anyway, this is kind of what I do and what works for our program. The thing that we found is being able to have interaction within each of the modules. Um, I like being able to do that. It does create a little bit of work for me to respond to all of those people, but I think that right now that's been really valuable for people to have interaction with, with you know, someone as they go through the course and then also learn from each other. So for example, um, we had a lot of people start talking about dyeing fibers with plants. Um, and there was a whole like 20 person, like 20 person long discussion about how to dye yarns and plants, which was super exciting. People are connected over bonsai plants because we have a few people who are interested and other people who are sharing. So it's been really great to see some of those interactions in there as we go through. And it's been important to me to be able to respond to those. It just does take a bit of time. Um, when it comes to the content and the time to make these, I've been working on this course since 2017 and I um, spend about six months of the year just working on it. And I would say I'm able to do about three to four modules a year. Um, this year I did four, which was kind of a lot, um, but it worked out well. And this year I should be entirely done. So there's still three modules in here, which are not complete. They follow some of the older formats. Uh, but by the end of this year, they should be entirely updated. So it does take a lot of work. That means it's been taking four years to really finish the entirety of this course. Uh, but once again, that's my job. That's what I have the pleasure and the honor to be able to do for our program um, and really make that happen. So um, other examples that we use to encourage interaction with the course agents, each other and current master gardeners, because that is the question, right? How do we make people connect? Uh, as much as possible. So we really do use those discussion forums. You'll see that we have like one on every topic area. Uh, and I go in there and we have, uh, I also added an as a teacher and a social board. So these were different ways for people to be able to connect. Uh, because this is coming from the state and it's just the training, we know that at the local level, people are also doing Zooms um, to try to meet up with individuals I've also tried to do, um, I've also tried to do half, uh, not happy hours. That would be fun, but not happy hours, office hours. Um, uh, nobody really came to the office hours though, which is fine. Um, and so that didn't seem to be as important for interacting, but those Zoom Q and A's because we bring in those agents or those experts have been really, really popular because people really like the opportunity to connect with uh, people. Question is, is are you able to jump around on the modules or it's a particular order? You can do whatever you want when you're in care. This is really a hands-off, which can be really intimidating for a lot of people. I wanna highlight the fact that, you know, this is something that people poke fun at millennials for, but it's legit, is that if you don't give me structure, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And this can be a little overwhelming because you can just do it however much you want, whenever you want. So I've laid it out in the order that I'd like you to take it, but if you wanted to, you can jump in. And I noticed this the first week that we were going in the indoor plants, because everybody was really excited about indoor plants. Um, they all started, there's a discussion post on sharing your plants. And the first week people went in there and started sharing all of their plants, because I think that this was a really important way for them to be able to connect with each other and talk about their plants and get excited. So that was super fun to be able to do. Um, so you can do it at other ones. So, um, Somebody asked about the top hat course. So I did not attend that program. Um, and primarily because within the University of Minnesota, this canvas is what I have to use and what's being offered. 
I don't have the capacity to pay for something else to do something differently. And because this is just what I've done and how I've gotten there, this works really well for me. We're lucky at the University of Minnesota that we do have resources to make this happen. Not all universities provide support or even the software infrastructure for non-academic programs to be able to do this. So not only can we use Canvas, but we can work with um, the registration system so that we have a more smoother way of getting people into the course that's pretty official. Um, and I have support from the University of Minnesota IT people if there's any issues or as things are updated. So this works really well for us. Um, and it doesn't make sense for our program to bring in an outside program or an outside kind of structure to help do that for us. Um, so that's kind of what we had. So this course is in Canvas um, because that's what the university uses. And, and I like it a lot. Um, Christy, you also, yeah. There was a question a while back um, from Kimberly, and she wanted to know how you keep people from signing up for the Master Gardener volunteer course, but not follow through since it's cheaper than the Prohort course. That's a great question. And yes. thank you, thank you, Nicole, for bringing that up because I, I saw that and I didn't remember to answer it. Um, so to become a Master Gardener volunteer, you have to apply at the local level. So it's still county-based in that regard, and you have to be interviewed and accepted at the local level. And then what happens is, is you're sent a link to register for the course. So the only way that you get the link to pay for the Master Gardener course is after you've been accepted. There's no other way to find that link. So there's really no way that um, to to get in there without having gone through the system of becoming a Master Gardener volunteer. Um, but thank you for that question. I've been talking for a long time and there's 10 minutes left. So are there any other questions or anything like that? Yes, feel free to unmute your mics, turn on your cameras. We've got a lot of time for Q&A. If anyone needs to jump off, that's fine. But if you wanna stay on and continue to ask Christy questions about best practices, we've got plenty of time to do that. Yeah, lots of time. Um, Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. So I have a question. Um, yeah. One of the things that we're noticing uh, here in my county, our office is still pretty much close to the public. And uh, we're trying to leverage, you know, how are we going to do an online training and then leverage it into virtual volunteer opportunities. So I can see in one way creating an online course such as yours, and this is excellent and helpful. But did you somehow um, mix in engagement opportunities to let them think about how to volunteer virtually or help with virtual help desk, with case studies and things like that. Um, uh, any examples? Yes. yes, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> ah, this, this is good because I should have highlighted that as well. So at the end of the course, um, we have, and you'll notice um, I've now put it in student view so you can see how it looks a little bit more cleaned up. Um, we have an engaging your community. So this is the last module and this is all specific towards volunteers. How can you engage with your community and how can you do this work? Obviously a lot of this is in person, right? Teaching an educational class. Um, but we do have different aspects in here that would be for volunteer um, volunteering online, such as uh, providing an answer to a question in person, over the phone or online with, um, with um, links to, you know, how to get to Ask Extension, which is the way we now do Ask an Expert. So we do provide that. And then as we go through, we're uh, trying to, we as a program within Minnesota is we worked with our leadership to create free, no contact person, um, no contact safe activities that people could do from home um, that we're encouraging people to do. So we let interns know that that is a possibility for that, um, for that learning and luckily or not for that learning for volunteering so we're trying to find avenues for people to do that and in my experience as we go through like answering those questions they're all doing it online already so it's kind of starting people to get them familiar with those online resources and what you can do within that um so i think that sort of helps answer that question um we don't obviously with the pandemic and, and its, its future outlook, we don't know how long we'll be doing what we're going to be doing. So we didn't do, a, like we didn't change a lot of that last module to just focus online. We still provided a lot of the other information, but as much as we can through it, uh, we wanted to uh, provide that information just so people could get familiar with it, but that's great. Um, 
And then I did see a question with people who uh, get accepted and not follow through. We do track that. So we had closer to about 500 people who applied for the program and then just through the process fell out. We probably lose about 20 to 50 people who just don't end up registering every year, but um, depending on the year. Obviously it's more when we have more people, uh, but that's a great question. Um, and then if, yeah, people don't follow through with their volunteer service, um, we ask them to pay the difference between the cohort and the non-cohort. So thank you for answering that. Um, do we know why the university moved from Moodle to Canvas? I'm not sure. Um, I feel like Canvas is better. So maybe that's why. Um, and then the virtual opportunities we're doing, I will show you quick. Um, so this is the main page that you'll go to as a volunteer to get information. So we have growing plants for distribution to those in need, growing a giving garden at home, and growing a walk-by plant pollinator friendly garden. So with these, we give kind of a guidelines to what this is, what this can look like, um, and what some of those expectations are. So the idea here is, you know, for us, if you live on a corner or someplace where people are going to walk by and see, you can totally get volunteer efforts for making a garden and putting up some educational signage so people start to become familiar with what pollinator gardens look like. So that's kind of a, a quick example of what that looks like. But these are great questions. Thank you. Hi. That was actually a nice way that you wrote up the virtual volunteer opportunities because you you've taken the time to kind of put the um the expectations the reason for doing that so even if you wanted to leverage it into an award application let's say you had some master gardeners who did a fantastic job you have most of the text written so that's i can see you tend to do things you know with multiple outcomes and doing something well once and then being able to you know reproduce things for a different yeah. clientele or circumstances. Thank you. And this I will add was all my colleague, Jackie Fremming. Mm -hmm. She is a participant um, on this call. So thank you, Jackie. But this thank is you, what she was able to put together. Um, we really do work as a team and I could not imagine not having the team that we do. We work, it's fantastic to have a, a good team and I'm really, really lucky that we're able to have that. Um, but yeah, this is something that we've been encouraging um, on top of what some of the local communities are already doing with those online. We've had a lot of people do online teaching um, through Zooms with their local library or something like that. Um, we really leave a lot of the volunteering aspects to the local community, which is, or the local programs, which is why it's not as highlighted in this program, because it really depends on the county and what their priorities are. But these three um, suggestions were ways that we really wanted to help enable counties who were really worried about, you know, how are our volunteers going to get experience? How can we get out there and do stuff? Because people really just want to do stuff. So this was our way to be able to um, provide some of provide some of that. And in Minnesota, we have a whole thing about how of volunteering and stuff that we need to get into. But um, but yeah, something how else I noticed on your yeah. uh, course outline. Uh, you had, you know, IPM, but above that you had DEI. So it sounds like you also make that a uh, core component of your Master Gardener volunteer training. Yeah, so we added that this year. It's something that we would do in person, but we never added it on, we didn't do it online. So we were able to get funds this year to build an entire diversity, equity, and inclusion content. Um, we hired outside experts because I am not an expert on that and we want to make sure that we were doing it right. Um, so we hired a consultant who came in and gave us a lot of really great content and then we all worked together to put it online into that format and it's actually been really fantastic and we've gotten a lot of really great feedback from people saying you know this is the first thing that we're diving into and I didn't expect this in a gardening course but that makes me think about this differently and so it's been really good. Um, some of the other questions, there are a total of five people on our team, but it's about two, I think it's two and a half or three and a half FTEs because several of those people are part-time. We have our director who's I think only a quarter time with the Master Gardener program. He a lot of other stuff that he does. Um, I'm full-time and then Jackie Fremming is also full-time as well. So we, we really do use the team approach and we're really lucky that we have that, but that means that we're able to do this work and those county positions, which if Katie was here, she would talk a lot more about this, is that the more that the state can take on, the more capacity county folks have to do other type of work and make an impact in their communities differently. Um, so that's kind of the approach that Minnesota takes. Um, 
do our volunteers normally get hours for volunteering in their own gardens? Not really. Um, that's something that we added this year for an educational garden. We do usually allow people to get volunteer credits for working in gardens that are have a, you know, for education or that support programs like children's gardens and things like that. This was a switch this year because we recognize that we don't have the capacity to do that because of a lot of the COVID restrictions. So if you're creating an educational garden that other people are experiencing, even if it's in your own front yard, that that, that totally should be fine for our COVID situation. Anyway, one minute left, any last questions? If you have any questions about this or you want to learn more, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff for how this happens. Definitely reach out and email me. I love talking about this and I've talked to a lot of people already about kind of our process and what we do um, and would love to show you more. So thank you so much also for having me. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Christy. And thanks, Jackie, who's also on the call for some of the other background information in the presentation. So just to summarize, I think some of the best practices, don't be afraid to not do a PowerPoint video and use stills and just use your own voice and uh, explain the content, chunking things out. Discussions are great. Um, leveraging into those virtual volunteer opportunities include non-hort topics like DEI and um, you get feedback from people who are taking the course just so you can continually improve it because it is an iterative process. You know, it's not going to stay stagnant. So yeah, great job. I think we all learned some new tips. And um, also, you know, if this is overwhelming to you, then sometimes your uh, university has um, an instructional design team and they'll work with any group across campus. And so at the University of Florida, for example, we do have access to the UF instructional design folks. And so they can help us with course creation. So check to see if that's available to you or even just have them look over what you've created and see if it makes sense. All right, so if anyone has any other questions, you can reach out to Christy, you could reach out to me. I'll uh, send the recording out to everyone so you have that. Um, and thank you all so much for your time. I hope you learned some new things today and good luck with your volunteer programs and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks again, Christy.